Welcome to the Oklahoma Friedman Research Series. This is the second episode in a series of videos devoted to discussing the history and the wonderful resources to find stories of Friedman from Indian Territory. Today's episode will focus on Choctaw and Chickasaw Friedman resources. And I am happy to share this with you. My goal is to encourage you to look beyond the Dawes Rolls. Of course, those Dawes Rolls are extremely important and to know where to find them is certainly essential. But also to look at some of those records that were created a little bit earlier than the Dawes Rolls as well. Anyway, let's get started. The first thing, the question is often, especially when I speak to beginning researchers, is, well, where do I find these records? Do I have to go to Oklahoma to find these records? Or do I have to go to a, a research library or a genealogical library to find the records? You can find them there, of course. But many of these records have been digitized, and they are online, and you can find them and research, search them right from your own home. Now, there are two resources online, Ancestry.com and Fall3.com. However, there's some other places as well. But let's take a look primarily at these two sites to see what they do offer. Now, both of these sites do present records of the five civilized tribes. And in another video, I will actually go live on the sites so you can see me walk through the sites because some of them it's kind of tricky to get to a specific collection that you might have in mind. But both of these sites do contain records from the five nations, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole nations. Now, there are advantages to each of them, and I have a subscription to both, so, you know, I, I'm um, on both of the sites, usually every day. On Ancestry, one of the things that many of us enjoy is the chance to look at the original DOS cards the way they appear. They have been digitized in color, and it's wonderful to see those. And you can see these two cards here. There's a Choctaw card at the top. In fact, that's the card of my great-grandparents. And um, you can see the Chickasaw card on the bottom. Now, on both three, they're not in color. Here are the same exact cards. They were digitized but copied from microfilm. So those images are in black and white. So of course you can see on one uh, where the tape had begun to fade, you can't see through it because it appears as if someone's taken a, a marker and blacked it out, when in reality they hadn't because when you see the color image, you can actually read through the tape and see the original words that are on the card. But the application jackets are in black and white on both sides. On Fold 3, as I said, these images are taken from microfilm and were digitized and placed online. Ancestry actually went to Fort Worth, which is where the original records are actually kept, and they digitized them themselves. And you, as you can see, they're still black and white images, and that's understandable because basically it's, it's, you know, it's just typewritten text onto white paper. So there was no need to have them digitized in color when all you would really see is black and white anyway. But they are basically the same on both sides. Ancestry does have the land allotment records. And many people don't realize um, that the Dawes records, the purpose of them was to redistribute land into personal land allotments, personal parcels of land to people who had owned land in common for decades. But this was now part of that process. This is the purpose of that, to determine eligibility for receipt of allotments of land. So it's, under, it's important to understand that that's a very important part of the process. That was the end result of all of the other records that led up to that. So it is good to see that Ancestry does have those land allotment records. And what's great is that you can get the legal land description and you can go on other sites 
and determine where that land allotment actually was. Now, each site does have its unique advantages. So let's take a look. Now, I think that Ancestry has maybe more. Now, they have tons and tons of things in their Native American collection. This is just a, a small portion of what they have. But when you start to look at specifically Indian territory, they have far more records from the territory than both they might have. And you can see all kinds of things. Indian censuses and roles, 1851 to 1959. They do, of course, have uh, photos. They have records from the Pioneer Papers, the Indian Pioneer Collection, historical collection, as they call it. These are actually from the Indian Pioneer Papers, which are part of the Western History Collection at the University of Oklahoma. So they have those. They have um, Indian land allotment sales. Many people are not aware of those. Also, um, they have some records that are very fascinating in terms of muster rolls before the removal. If you look down, you'll see U.S. Cherokee um, uh, muster rolls, 1835 to 38. We're talking about the years of removal. So you can see where people were at the time before they were removed to the West. So just all kinds of interesting things that are there. Citizenship case files. So numerous things that are there. Ball 3, on the other hand, has a very quick, in my opinion, a quicker and more efficient interface, meaning you can browse more easily when if you're conducting a community project. And I urge you to take on a project. Many people don't know that they really can undertake a project and, and start to, to own what you're researching, so to speak. Uh, but when you're trying to look at a community, let's say your folks are from Tishomingo or Atoka or wherever, Eagle Town, and you want to see, well, are there others from that community? You can browse very quickly because when you click on a name, it pops up immediately if you're looking at the enrollment cards, which is a good way for you to determine, look in that upper left-hand corner for that post office and residence to say, ah, there's another person who lived in that community, another person who lived, whether it was Scullyville or Stringtown or Stonewall or wherever it may have been, um, you can really browse through much more quickly, in my opinion. Now, Ancestry does have some essential, what I call essential, DAWs, pre-DAWs era records that you can look at. You see on the image to the right where it says CTN, that stands for Choctaw Nation. And they have a lot of records that at one time were part of the Indian Archives Division of the Oklahoma, well, they still are part of the Indian Archives Division of the Oklahoma Historical Society. And some of these records have been for years, for decades, on microfilm, but now they have also digitized those records. So if you don't live in Oklahoma, can't get to Oklahoma City, then you can still look at some of those same images on Ancestry. So it's very, very useful to see some of those. Now, Fall 3, one thing I like about that site is that it produces thumbnails. So when you want to do just a quick zoom in on something, uh, when you're scanning records or just, just, just skimming through a collection of records, you can look and say, oh, okay, that's an interview. I might want to read that. Oh, there's another document there. I want to take a look at that. In this case, you see uh, Newton Roberts is highlighted there. I can look at that right away and see that on page 10, as you look at the thumbnails on the right, oh, there's a marriage record. And you can zoom in and pull that up. And in fact, as I said, I encourage you to undertake projects. You might decide, well, let me record the marriages, as many marriages as I can, that were captured in some of these records. Now, I will say, Every single file does not have a marriage record. Understand that. In fact, most of them don't, but many do. So one thing good about Vol 3, as you flip through and you look through the thumbnails, you can still recognize from a distance as you're looking at the larger collection, you can tell, oh, that looks like a marriage record. So you have a chance to zoom in. And I like that, that aspect of working on Vol 3. Now, 
both of these databases are subscription sites. But if you say, well, I don't know if I can afford to have a subscription to both of them, well, you know, check your local library. Many libraries have subscriptions to Ancestry, and many libraries might give you access to some of their databases through your library card. So you want to just check and see if you have that kind of access through your local library, because if you do, certainly you'll still have a chance to take a look at both of those. Now, we're talking about Chickasaw and Choctaw resources. Where can you find them? There's some numbers that I want you to learn. And we should know these numbers. You know how when you go through school, whether or not history is taught correctly or incorrectly, uh, which we know in many cases it's not always taught, uh, we'll say completely, I'll use that word. Um, but you still come, up, come out of school with a few dates in your head. Um, you know, we have that uh, date of 1776. Oh, yeah, the American Revolution. Oh, yes. Um, we know that there, 1865, the Civil War came to an end. But we have certain dates and numbers in our head, whether or not uh, they mean a lot to us or not. But do we have numbers in our head? And and when it comes to our own history, just like you know your own home address, you know your own personal social security number, there's certain things you commit to memory and certain things that you teach your children to, to know very early on. What's your home address? You know, what are your parents' names? Well, as we start to look at our history, we need to have some numbers in our own mind. 4,995 Chickasaw Creek. Have you ever heard that number? Has anyone ever presented that number to you? 5,254 Choctaw Freedmen. Have you ever heard that number? Has anyone ever shared that with you? Now, these numbers are taken from actually a compilation of, of individuals uh, who went through the Dawes enrollment process. And in fact, some of these numbers were published in local newspapers, but after that, many people just kind of went off into the distance. There were 91,000 people who went through the whole Dawes process. That's talking about all of the five tribes, all of the different categories, by blood, freedmen, intermarried whites, minors, newborns. And there were 91,000 people. At the very, very end, those who were approved, and were approved for land allotments, 4,995. That is almost 5,000 to the South region. A little over 5,000, almost 5,300 or so Choctaw Creek. We need to know those numbers because think about it. That's 10,000 people, 10,000 plus people if you add those two numbers together. Just from those two nations alone, those 10,000 people, how many thousands of descendants do those 10,000 people have today? It's a lot of people who have a lot of rich history, many of whom don't even know that this history is there for them to find. And as a result, these are things that we need to understand that our history belongs on that historical landscape as much as any other community. And this is just alone two nations, Chickasaw and Choctaw. If we add Friedland from the other three tribes, we'll have over 20,000 people. That's a big population. So these two nations combined, over 10,000 people were eligible for land allotments as Friedland. Now, as we look at these two categories of individuals classified as Friedland, we know there were some that were just the straight Friedman cards. Then there were those who were denied. And I encourage you to look at the denied cards as well. Look at the minors. Look at the new ones. Look at the rejected. Now, the numbers that I just gave you were reflecting only those numbers of people who were approved. That would not include those who applied and were later rejected. However, you as a researcher, you want to become familiar with all of those categories and start to read those files. And hopefully, you'll be encouraged or inspired to move beyond just 
oh, I'm only looking for my grandpa and my grandpa's family. But your grandpa may have had siblings. Your grandpa certainly had co-workers. Your grandpa certainly lived within a community. That person probably worshiped at a church with others, neighbors, friends. You want to start to look at the, the community that surrounded your family because that's where those stories are found. My goal is, of course, to encourage you to become a storyteller, to not just put up a list of names. No one wants to read a list of names. It's nice to see the list, and it's nice that maybe your ancestor is on that list, but what can you tell me about those individuals? So all of this research is going to help us to reconstruct, in many cases, some of those stories that have been buried for quite a long time. Now, we also have that chance to look at some earlier Dawes records. On um, Ancestry, you can take a look at the 1885 Choctaw Chickasaw Freedman census, and it's important to see that and to see what they consist of. And you'll see, for example, here's one looking at a particular community in the Choctaw Nation, and you'll see that there are all kinds of books. Now, these are handwritten records, and you'll see that some of these records, now, you'll find that this form, this preprinted form, was used in earlier years as well. I've seen some of uh, families that were recorded with this particular form in the late 1860s as well. But it's still important to take a look at this. When you look at a Dawes card, sometimes you see a notation that this person appeared on the 19, I'm sorry, on the 1896 roll, and maybe the name was spelled a little differently, or maybe they had a different surname. Well, often they're referring to some of these records that you're looking at now. And there are numerous records that are there. And certainly you're encouraged to, you know what, start to browse, because I'll tell you why. Your family may have lived in Scullyville um, by the time of the Dawes Commission. But it's very, very possible at the time that they were actually adopted in 1880s, 1885, they were probably in Eagle Town or another community. And also you find individuals, even though this is a Choctaw document, you also find individuals who were living in Chickasaw communities as well, and vice versa. So it's important to take a look at these records and to also just to start to become familiar, become familiar with names that were really just a part of that community. I researched Scullyville a lot, and frequently I see Eubanks all over the place. It was a very large family, it was a very large clan, uh, and they're there. I can even find earlier records where some of the Eubanks appear as Hugh Banks with an H, H-U-G-H. -H. And so you sort of see that sort of thing, but that becomes part of the story too. Not necessarily that they spelled it that way because some of them couldn't read or write, but someone wrote it down in that manner. And to see how maybe a family's name evolved over the years, we want to incorporate some of that into that story. Now, you also zoom in sometimes on ledgers. This is a, um, a, a label that was just pasted on, on a ledger that was microfilmed. And so you can see some of these. And some of these you find very, very uh, oddly written notes that appear sometimes. And that can be very, very interesting. In this particular case, you see the case of William Murray. And it talks about as he and his wife, Alice, and their eight children, and they were applying for citizenship. And so they were subpoenaed and were brought to the area to tell parts of their own story. And it talks about the fact that, you know, they were here, this applicant was here at the time of events. He's been remaining here all this time. It talks about the same situation with the wife, his wife Alice, and you get some additional information that you don't see because the Dawes Commission, they don't always ask, well, where were you at the time of emancipation? Some of those questions you might see in an interview, but some of them you may not see. But when you go through these 
earlier rows, you'll start to see other notations that appear. And of course, there is a challenge. We know that the challenge is getting through some of that penmanship. But after a while, your hand gets used or your eye gets used to reading either an older script or just um, uh, not the neatest penmanship, perhaps, of the person who was recording the data. But it's good, useful information. You get information of an earlier road. I mentioned the 1896 road, and you get that information as well. And you can see how they recorded the information, <clears throat> the name of the individuals. This is from Boktuklu, and um, which is pretty far south in the Choctaw Nation. And you can see whether some were literate. They recorded that information. And um, just very, very useful useful data and here you can see the ledger from which it was taken and but you take a look inside of that it's 1896 but notice the categories they have what they call well the number of the person is the number one number two etc the christian name in full uh whether the person uh was married or not their marital status but over to the right you can see once held in slavery by the Choctaws, and that was that column was just filled in with yes or no. And a lot of times, those who had the no were actually held by Chickasaw. So you do find that as well. This is what the complete page might look like, and that particular uh, on that particular document. So you want to become familiar. This is something you don't see in Dawes records, so it's important to take. A look at these as well. And then you see some who were those who admitted to citizenship. You even find the names of some on some of the same collections on the same microfilm because you, even though you're at your computer, you're actually going through a reel of microfilm. And as you advance through, you even find the names of some who elected to leave. But of course, we know many did not leave because they were never given that money that they were promised. And some ended up, in fact, on the final Dawes rolls as well. And you also find just details, all kinds of details. And sometimes you'll find a notation in some sort of bond. Now, this was actually a misplaced document. Right in the middle of an 1896 roll was a bond of Jim Goss. And as you scan it, and you need to scan these things, I belong to a group on Facebook. And um, many of the people who research and who are part of the May Tubby family, and I'm looking here, and they're talking about heirs of the children of Hazen May Tubby. I shared this with them recently, and um, but who knew a misplaced item in a ledger from one year? It's another year's document was just sort of collected, folded in it, and it got microfilmed and thus digitized. And um, you never know what you're going to find when you develop that sense of curiosity. But again, this is something that individuals related to this family may want to say, well, wait a minute, what's going on? They're talking about the, the heirs. Well, what's the situation here? Uh, there's something about a $300 sum that um, they're, you know, looking for the, the heirs of this man who was apparently deceased at that point. So, you know, You've got to develop some curiosity. I'm sure the historian for that family may really want to get into this, find out or maybe piece together a story they may have heard. Yeah, there was some issue about great, great grandpa's children didn't get something or maybe they did get something. This kind of curiosity about what's in these records will help you to construct that story much better. I simply want to just say that as descendants, we do hold the key to telling untold stories and exploring those, those resources that we just don't know about as much. Our story is amazing. 20,000 people have something to say. 20,000 people who have a documented tie to not only this, this Western frontier community that at some point at the beginning of the 20th century became the state of Oklahoma. 20,000 people of African descent have documented ties to five Indian communities, five Native American communities. We have an important story to tell. 
And also those who came before us deserve to have their story told. And those who follow us definitely deserve to have this given to them as part of their legacy. So I encourage you to start to just look at some of these records, just a quick overview on some just gems that you can find on Ancestry and Fold 3. And um, to have some fun with it, um, just get involved, become a storyteller. You are the keeper of that story. And it's important to tell that story. Join a community. There are all kinds of groups that are out there, some of which are involved with historic preservation. Others may be involved with political issues. Uh, if that is your interest, certainly there. Take a look at other publications that have been written. Some don't exist anymore, but maybe it's time to create some new publications. Time to put your hands on some other things that are there. I'm always excited to share with you my projects from the last two years, Freedmen of the Frontier, Volumes 1 and 2. But, you know, there are people out there. We have such rich stories to tell. Join a community of other people who are sharing their stories, storytellers. Research Freedmen from other nations, not just your own one single tribe. Your folks had neighbors. And the Choctaw Freedmen had relatives and friends who were Chickasaw Freedmen. These two territories bordered on the Cherokee Nation or the Creek Nation or the Seminole Nation. And there's some who actually have relatives in all five of those tribes. So you really want to connect with individuals who are, who are interested in historic preservation. We all have stories to tell connect with individuals who are active in the descendants of freedmen of the five civilized tribes. They're the Muskogee Creek freedmen, many of whom were very involved with researching their own history, as well as certainly fighting for their rights within the nation. You have the Choctaw and Chickasaw freedmen descendants who are active on Facebook. You also have the Cherokee freedmen descendants who are active on Facebook. You want to make that connection. Think about becoming engaged with the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, a group of individuals who are also working to encourage you to tell your story. We all have rich stories to tell, and I encourage you to just expand what you're doing. It is not just a DAWs card. It's not just a DAWs role. It's not just a DAWs number. You may want to join us the first Saturday of the month, beginning in August at noon central time that's one eastern time and to start to find individuals who are part of the collective for becoming and making a commitment to telling those stories anyway thank you all i'm just happy that um you've taken some time to listen and i hope that you'll join me the next time in the oklahoma freedman resource